in the crowded part of Dublin town. The bedraggled hordes are gathering, seeking passage to a new world home, leaving all they've ever loved and To escape or die from tyranny The first stop they'll make is Liverpool In the cellars there below the street Down among the vermin and disease Some hide out until their ships can leave Lest they be deported back again This year America So they race for Canada before the ice closes the St. Lawrence. Now the crossing is so treacherous, with so many crammed into the hole. The conditions are most suitable To the passing of the sickness oh. All along the way they're dying Upon an icy swell, those with strength to see the river still are now witnessing the dead of night to a strange macabre spectacle. Bloated bodies drifting out to sea And anchored up across Seal Canada Forty vessels line the St. Lawrence At the station there for quarantine The sheer magnitude of suffering Is beyond the helpless volunteer Thousands they will perish there Despite all efforts to contain the spread I'm Mark McGowan of the Department of History at the University of Toronto and I'm here at Strokestown Park House in Strokestown, County Roscommon uh, in Ireland. 
and I'm in the library of the Packenham Man uh, big house, so to speak, on the Strokestown estate. And in this very room, this library, the decision was made by Major Dennis Mann in 1847 uh, to assist or uh, evacuate 1,490 of his tenants uh, with the intent of relieving some of the misery of the famine here uh, on his estate uh, and then sending uh, these individuals and families uh, to Canada uh, via Dublin on board four ships that had been booked for them uh, in the port of Liverpool. So in the spring of 1847, 274 families uh, were rounded up uh, and then had to walk the distance along the Royal Canal uh, from near to Strokestown uh, to the port of Dublin, uh, be ferried across the Irish Sea, uh, taken to Liverpool, and then they boarded with tickets prepaid uh, the Virginius, the Naomi, Aaron's Queen, and the John Munn. Uh, it's estimated that some of those passengers traded their tickets at dock uh, and vanished. Uh, but my work at the University of Toronto with several research teams is to try to figure out what happened to these people once they landed at Quebec and what kind of lives did they rebuild uh, once they were in uh, both British North America and eventually uh, the United States. Um, these individuals and families had been suffering terribly uh, during the famine here and in the years leading up to the famine with uh, wet weather, with the great wind of 1839, uh, with tremendous debt from the damage that had been done uh, to their properties over those years. Uh, Major Dennis Mann decided that it was most opportune to give these people another chance and at the same time free up lands for further development on his estate. Uh, one of the reports that came back uh, by uh, mid-year was that perhaps as many as 50% of these people had died either en route to Quebec or in the quarantine station at Grosse Isle. Um, our research has discovered that perhaps 30% uh, of those people perished given the records at Grosse Isle regarding deaths at sea and regarding uh, internments on the island, uh, which left approximately uh, uh, over 100 families uh, that we could try to track uh, through the port of Montreal, eventually Kingston and Toronto, and then to points south of the border into the United States. Uh, those people recreated in some places lives uh, that they had left here. For example, on the Niagara Peninsula near Niagara Falls, several of the families from this estate uh, found work on the Welland Canal and reconstructed life at Queenston, Ontario. Others uh, found life in inner city Montreal and several families were located uh, in the middle of that city. One of the things that is most troubling though to the researcher is how inadequate the records are for the period that we are trying to study. The 1490 disappear very quickly uh, to, to us as researchers because of inaccurate records of huge gaping holes in the records, the lack of shipping lists to Quebec until after 1865, and to the very simple fact that in colonial society, people were constantly on the move. They moved through cities, they moved through the farmsteads, uh, they moved constantly uh, through uh, the New World. So that makes them very, very difficult to pin down at any given point in time when a census might be taken or some routinely generated record produced that might give us some clues as to where they are. In the end, out of the 274 family units that left this particular estate, we've been able to, uh, to track successfully about 103. Uh, and in addition to that, perhaps as many as 40 orphan children who lost their parents either at sea or in the fever sheds of Quebec, Montreal, uh, and eventually Toronto. So we've reconstructed life for these people to the best of our abilities, and that search continues.
here. I'm in County Roscommon in Ireland at Strokestown and on the manorial estate of the Pakenham Mann family. Uh, in the 1840s, it was Dennis Mann, who was the landlord of a very large estate of close to 11,000 inhabitants, uh, who became well known uh, across Ireland and in the diaspora for assisting close to 1,490 people off his estate, uh, boarding them uh, on uh, ferries from Dublin to Liverpool, and then bound to Quebec, Canada, uh, on four ships out of Liverpool, the Virginius, uh, the Aaron's Queen, the Naomi, and the John Munn. Now, the Virginius and the Aaron's Queen left first, taking probably about half of the 271 families who are commemorated on the glass wall behind me. Uh, the Virginius, uh, which was the largest of the ships carrying most of the passengers, uh, in fact, was likened to the Black Hole of Calcutta, uh, given the conditions on board ship. Uh, by the time these 1,490 had crossed the Atlantic, uh, close to about a third of them had died, uh, either at sea or in the quarantine station at Grosse Ile in Quebec. Uh, each one of these families is marked by the head of the family on this wall, including some of the uh, stories that emerge from this famine period. In the Kilmackenny townland, for example, uh, the story of Thomas Brennan, who eventually dies uh, at the hands of the government for committing murders in the Niagara. You have the story of Patrick Cox from the Coolia townland, uh, who uh, is uh, quarantined at Gros Ile and then reunited with his family uh, in Hamilton, uh, now in Canada. Um, this is a, a tragic and a gripping story uh, of people trying to seek out a new life in a new world, uh, fleeing the famine. And the only testimony for the most part that we have today is this glass wall behind me. Behind me, uh, the manorial home of the Pakenham Mann family uh, started the construction of this Palladian house in 1696, uh, and essentially it was the command center for a very large estate with uh, approximately 11,000 inhabitants in the middle of the 19th century. Um, one of the distinctive features of this house was the fact that uh, during the Great Irish Famine, um, the proprietor, Major Dennis Mann, uh, was uh, uh, the first of the landlords during that period to be assassinated. Uh, he, was, he was shot in the head uh, while returning home from a meeting uh, of a charitable organization in Roscommon Town, uh, and his murder still remains uh, a fascinating mystery. Uh, although two men were hanged uh, and implicated by others on the estate uh, for having been involved in the murder, it's still not entirely clear who pulled the trigger that killed the landlord. In fact, it appears that the ringleader was a one uh, a tenant by the name of Andrew Connor. And Andrew Connor disappeared from the estate uh, during the court proceedings uh, and was then spotted in Montreal in Canada, uh, later in Vermont, uh, in New York State, uh, and allegedly working with his brothers on the Welland Canal, which connects Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, bypassing the famous Niagara Falls. Um, very possible that he was there because there were Connors on the uh, employment list uh, of the Welland Canal Works and it was also a magnet uh, for Irish migrants, particularly from this particular part of, uh, of County Roscommon. So Andrew Connor uh, is last seen in Port Robinson in Upper Canada in a roughly 1849-1850 and then disappears into the east of history. Um, so whether or not we really know who murdered Dennis Mann uh, is still subject to some contention and further investigation. But the house still stands even though the landlord uh, is now buried in a crypt not far away from this house. Deep in your memory, deep in the dreaming, deep beneath the beating of your ancient heart, there burns a spirit, a strong, noble spirit. Remember, deep beyond memory, back before the dreaming, deep in the blood that is flowing through our bodies, we are the people, we are the children, 
the children of the land of the scholar and the poet. Remember our heritage, hold on to its beauty, keep alive the music of our native tongue, but don't forget our sorrows and all of our sadnesses. Reflect on all that we have overcome. If we can remember, we can try to understand. If we can understand, we can learn to forgive. If we can forgive, we can begin to grow. Remember, remember, remember. Godawin of the Chivne, Godawin of the Ashling, Godawin for Hushle, the Hamachri. Ta Anna McDo, Anna Ursel, the Stream, Kivnik, Kivnik. Godawin Riven Kivne, Sir Honig and Ashling, Godawin Savil, the Thai Gritchy the Corp. Is Mudna on Pobble, Is Mudna on Oike, Schlochna Scolari, Is Fili or Nuche. Kövniger ar náirecht, Cúnig láv ar an áilecht, Cúnig ciúl ar dianga bríver agus bíó, Ach ná dármad ar gáhu, Is an dhovrón galeir, Cúnig láv ar an méid, Ar hánig wyd harris. Ás féderlín kövnú, Is taacht ar an tishkint, Ás féderlín tishkint, Máfar an crí. Má wáhmid a chéile, Tugig borra agus fós, Kovnig, Kovnig, Kovnig. I'm here beside the Royal Canal in County Longford in Ireland along the Great Famine Way. In front of me is a pair of bronze shoes, uh, in a sense representing uh, the 1490 and many others who used this as their great highway to Dublin uh, in 1847 and 1848, fleeing the worst ravages of the Irish Famine. Now if you look down the canal behind me, just imagine that in 1847, each bank was teeming with hundreds of people, carts full of baggage, uh, carts with victuals for the 1490 that had been provided to them uh, by Major Dennis Mann as part of their assisted program off his estate at Strokestown Park and on their way uh, to homes, uh, hopefully, in Upper Canada. And if you can imagine the, the noise and the smells and the gaggle of, of, of close to 900 children uh, who would have been part of this, having to be corralled from the canal and from the canal steep banks uh, by their parents, uh, herded quickly by the bailiffs that were sent uh, under the command of, of, uh, of Bailiff Robinson from Strokestown. Imagine, too, the barges that are in this canal, actually some of them filled with foodstuffs, which makes the whole scene rather ironic, as those fleeing famine are walking alongside barges that in some cases may have been full uh, of grain headed for export. Um, men inebriated on board these ships because they drank beer in copious quantities, catcalling the young girls uh, along the shore, the horses pulling the barges, defecating freely, uh, and people having to walk through it. Um, it was a scene here at Abbey Shrew of absolute chaos as people were trying to move as quickly as possible to the port of Dublin and then be ferried uh, to, their, to their British destination nation and that is Liverpool uh, and finally to Quebec. Borogus Foss, Kuivnig, Kuivnig, Kuivnig. Here I'm in a very rainy Mullingar in uh, West Meath County uh, in Ireland and behind me is one of the uh, only existing famine structures in Mullingar. It's a workhouse. Uh, there were workhouse unions all across Ireland in the 1840s. They had been established here by the British government in order to relieve uh, certain degrees of deserving poverty. Uh, unfortunately, the model used in Ireland was completely inappropriate and the government was told so uh, because this was a largely rural country as opposed to uh, what was already had been done uh, in Great Britain. Nevertheless, these would be places where destitute uh, Irish famine victims would go, uh, begging for food and accommodation and, of course, working for it because if they were to work, then they could eat. 
Um, the door in front of you would be where they would be greeted by the head of the workhouse. Men and women would be separated, as was boys and girls. They would live in different wings. Uh, they would eat daily, but of really questionable quality of food. Uh, and uh, many were turned away from the workhouses when they were full. They were run by boards of guardians who had very little uh, in terms of flexibility in allowing more uh, than what was warranted. Uh, but in the end, during the famine period, most workhouses in Ireland, much like this one, were overtaxed uh, and people eventually began sleeping in the yards and taking their food outside. Uh, this was what was referred to as outdoor relief. But this was really some place that Irish people dreaded to go. Uh, and uh, the workhouse became synonymous with misery during the famine. <laughs> I'm here on the National Famine Way uh, near the Royal Canal en route to Kilcock and uh, it offers an opportunity to, to reflect upon the journey made on this very footpath uh, in 1847 by 1490 of Major Dennis Mann's uh, tenants from his estate at Strokestown in County Roscommon. But it also gives us time to pause and think about the way in which land was held in Ireland at the time. Uh, that the land had been subdivided between landlords who were both English and Anglo-Irish who held large estates uh, and uh, thousands of tenants, native Irish, uh, who essentially paid rent to these landlords for small plots of land. Now the size of the estates varied from place to place in Ireland. Each estate was divided into a civil parish and into several town lands and usually an Irish person at that time as a tenant would identify less as being Irish and identify more with their town land. The town land was the heart of, of, uh, of Irish identity for those who worked the land, who, who used those those very small plots that they paid for through rent each year uh, to sustain themselves. And it was through this landholding system that the catastrophe of 1847 is made all the more terrible. And that is, as families grew in the early 19th century, and as the farm plots were subdivided between family members, it meant less and less uh, could be grown extensively on smaller and smaller holdings, which made them ideal for the lazy beds that provided the potato. The potato was rich in nourishment. It grew plentifully. When you pulled a potato stalk out of the ground, there was a great bounty of tubers that came out. And so it was only natural that if you lived on very small pieces of land uh, and essentially were trying to sustain your family and estimated that an average man in the 1840s in Ireland ate about 14 pounds of potatoes a day, that that this was a landholding system that made everything far worse when the potato failed. Beneath the beating of your ancient heart, there burns a spirit. I'm sitting here uh, at the harbour uh, in Maynooth, County Kildare, Ireland, here on the Royal Canal. Uh, by a, a set of shoes, of course, that would have been uh, the commemoration to the 1,490 migrants who would have passed this way from Dennis Mann's estate in Strokestown en route to Dublin, Liverpool, and then British North America through the port of Quebec. Um, one of the things that they would have noted is the magnificent spire of the Chapel of St. Patrick's College, which was the principal place where Catholic priests were trained uh, in Ireland. Um, this is a special moment also to reflect on the role of the churches, both the Anglican Church here in Ireland, called the Church of Ireland, and the Roman Catholic Church, both here uh, and in British North America, because it was the churches that were among the first responders when the migrants landed in British North America. It was the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church that took in uh, the, the hundreds of orphans, uh, including over 40 orphans from man's estate. Um, the churches were enormously important in the 
the way in which uh, they protected the children and then placed the children on farms and in businesses uh, across the what is now the province of Quebec uh, and in other centres uh, in central Canada. Um, the Anglican Church did the same, particularly in the Montreal area and the eastern townships. But it was the churches uh, in a time when there wasn't extensive government social services that really filled in the gap and play an understated role, I think, in our historiography about the Irish famine. Was Federlin Kuvnu is Tachter and Tischkind. Was Federlin Tischkind, Maffer and Cree. Mawahmedi Chele took a borrowed as false. Kuvnig, Kuvnig, Kuvnig. Deep in your memory, deep in the dreaming, deep beneath the beating of your ancient heart, there burns a spirit, a strong, noble spirit. Remember, deep beyond memory, back before the dream. I'm on board a replica of the Jeannie Johnson here in the Liffey River in Dublin. It's a replica of a famine ship that was actually built in Canada but sailed after 1847, so it wouldn't have been a ship uh, that would have carried uh, any of the 1490 from, from Strokestown. Uh, what it does, though, is gives you a sense of the size of the average ship that transported famine migrants uh, from Ireland and from British ports uh, to, uh, to British North America and the United States from 1847 on. Uh, the interesting thing about where we are now at Customs House Key is this is where the first mention of Dennis Mann's 1490 comes into the papers. And on 25th of May, it is said that the first wave of his migrants arrived. They were from the Kilglass uh, Parish. Uh, there were about 130, according to the local Dublin news. And for the first time, it was recorded that these people actually knew where they were going. And it wasn't Quebec one of the crowd told the reporter that they were going to Upper Canada, uh, which is one of the first pieces of information from the Berrien in Quebec City, a weekly newspaper, that we actually know that these people may have had some agency in terms of who they met when they crossed the ocean and where they intended to settle or sojourn. Now, unfortunately, on ships like this, uh, you had a mixed bag of... Uh, of, of captains who took care of the passengers in their care and those who did not. These were not passenger vessels, essentially. These were cargo ships uh, that usually carried timber and, and grain and other cargo that would be refitted across the Atlantic Ocean using human ballast instead of stones. The four ships, very much like this one, uh, that the 1490 uh, sailed on, uh, Aaron's Queen, uh, the John Munn, the Naomi, and the Virginius, sailed out of Liverpool, and at least three of those ships had captains with, how should we say, less than adequate sanitary, food, or medical conditions on board the vessels. Unfortunately, by the time these ships reach Gros Seal and the quarantine, about 30% of uh, the, the household heads had died, and close to uh, one quarter, or one, over one in every four passengers had, had died. Interestingly enough, and ironically here on the Jeannie Johnson, it had a perfect record of no deaths at sea when it sailed. In the crowded port of Dublin town here at Grosil, uh, the quarantine station in the St. Lawrence River. And behind me is the large Celtic cross that was erected here on Telegraph Hill in 1909 by the Ancient Order of Hibernians, which is a, a fraternal uh, benevolent association of Irish Catholics, both in Canada and the United States. And it was here in 1909 that Jeremiah Gallagher, a member of that order from Quebec City, 
was really the architect of having this memorial uh, to the many Irish dead uh, erected on this island. Um, prior to that, the island had been fairly uh, derelict, and it was through the agency of, of Irish Canadians uh, and wanting to memorialize their Irish ancestors uh, that prompted the building of this, uh, this huge monument on the island, um, really representing not only the some five to six thousand who lie buried here after the calamity of 1847 and 1848, uh, but also as a, uh, as a testament to all Irish migration uh, to uh, North America, both Canada and the United States. It would be at this point where towering over the island, uh, if you could imagine 170 years ago watching thousands of, uh, of refugees from the Irish famine uh, crowded into lazarettos, including uh, those people from uh, Dennis Mann's estate, uh, the survivors of the 1,490 assisted immigrants uh, uh, who uh, disembarked Ireland in the spring, and this would have been their first contact with Canada. Behind me is the Celtic Cross on Gorosil, the Quarantine Island. This cross was erected in 1909 by the Ancient Order of Hibernians, but it truly in itself is a, a study in different interpretations of the famine. There are four panels on the cross. Uh, the one that's immediately behind me commemorates those priests who served uh, the famine migrants both here on the island and you'll even see Michael Powers name the Bishop of Toronto who died in 1847 tending to the uh, famine victims in the fever sheds in, in his city. But the other three panels basically offer an interpretation of what happened here on the island. In English, very basic, that uh, the, these people, the Irish, had come defending their faith, uh, coming to the island, and here was their last resting place. Um, the French is slightly different because it adds perhaps a bit more of a Catholic tone, that this was their, their precious faith, and they were here uh, receiving the benefit of uh, the Roman Catholic priests of Quebec. Now there's also an inscription in Irish and in Irish script which most visitors to the island unless you were from Ireland would not understand. It's a far more nationalistic interpretation of an artificial famine and these victims of the oppressor uh, implying that the British had created this catastrophe and these were the victims. Long live Ireland. So a very different interpretation on one of the panels than on the other two. Uh, making history a little bit more complex than just black and white answers. Here at Grosil, Quebec, uh, the quarantine station where thousands of Irish died uh, on their journey to Canada in 1847 and 48. Um, in the bay behind me would have been the bay in which, uh, if in your mind's eye you can imagine 40 or 50 ships uh, in waiting uh, for their turn to be inspected by the medical officers uh, who would uh, take passengers who are ill off the ships. So, for example, uh, at any given time, uh, uh, you would have uh, a large number of ships, including some of those ships that had been uh, chartered by Major Dennis Mann. So, for example, the Virginius, one of the most notorious coffin ships that lost almost half of its passengers, would have been anchored in this bay, as would have been the Naomi, uh, Aaron's Queen, and the John Munn, uh, among the hundreds of ships that traveled here uh, in 1847 uh, and needed to pass through uh, with flying colors, so to speak, uh, this quarantine station en route uh, to Quebec and to other uh, places in the interior of Canada. I'm standing at Grosil about uh, 40 kilometers uh, to the northeast of uh, Quebec City and the St. Lawrence River and this was the principal quarantine station for uh, the province of Canada uh, during the Great Famine. Uh, here, uh, thousands of Irish migrants landed and had to be cleared. The sick uh, were kept here uh, and uh, I'm standing actually in the, the graveyard, the mass grave where in 1847 over 5,200 people 
uh, were died and were buried here. And you can see by the patterns in the ground, the undulations, that uh, this was a mass grave, although each and every individual who died uh, was buried uh, in a coffin. The soil levels were uh, far too shallow here, so coffins were needed. Uh, and uh, by the end of the closing of this particular uh, cemetery, uh, close to 6,000 uh, people fleeing the famine in 1847 and in 1848 uh, were buried. Um, it's truly moving. Uh, it's the, one of the largest mass graves of Irish migrants anywhere uh, in the world. Uh, and now it's a national historic site uh, here in Canada. Here at Grosil, the uh, famine quarantine station uh, in the St. Lawrence River, about 40 uh, kilometers to the northeast of Quebec. And uh, uh, here uh, in 1847, uh, over 5,000 uh, famine migrants uh, died and were buried in the large cemetery behind me. But the monument uh, that's immediately beside me here is a monument that really is a, a testimony to the courage and the work of the first responders on the island. Um, this monument is dedicated to four physicians who died uh, during the, uh, the sailing season of 1847, including an immigrant himself, Dr. Benson, who had no sooner disembarked from the ships and helped uh, his fellow passengers than he contracted uh, the, uh, the contagion, this ship's fever, and, and died here. Um, the chief medical officer of the island, uh, George Mellis Douglas, is, is not memorialized here uh, because he survived uh, the famine sailing seasons. Uh, and worked tirelessly uh, amidst quite adverse conditions, both in terms of the physical structures of the island and in terms of the volume of people that hadn't been anticipated in 1847. Um, but nevertheless, uh, typhus, an infectious disease that could not be treated adequately in the 19th century, uh, claimed the lives of most of the victims who lie uh, in the cemetery behind me. Uh, basically, their first contact with Canada and their final place of rest. In the crowded part of Dublin town. Here on Grosil, and I'm inside uh, one of the uh, lazarettos that was built in 1847 to house uh, the very ill uh, famine migrants, mostly from Ireland. Um, it was here uh, that uh, one of the young men who had been a tenant on Dennis Mann's estate in Strokestown, a young lad by the name of Patrick Cox, uh, was found to be infected on board ship and was taken here uh, for his recovery. One of the reasons why we know this is because his mother and siblings, uh, the widow Cox, uh, moved into the Canadian interior. And in the summer, of 1847, she placed an advertisement in a local Hamilton newspaper wanting to know if anyone had any information with regard to her son Patrick, who had been left here under the care of Dr. Douglas Edgros Eel. Now, it's very difficult to determine whether or not she and her son Patrick were ever united because there were two widow Coxes that set sail with the 274 families uh, from Strokestown in County Roscommon. Uh, there is a Patrick Cox who is listed here at Grosil as having been deceased, but no age is given, and we knew that this Patrick Cox was a teenager. But in the 1851 census for Hamilton, we do find Mrs. Cox and we do find a teenager Age son Patrick. So we may also assume that the young Patrick Cox, who lay in one of the buildings very much like this, uh, did recover and was sent by Canadian emigration authorities inland and rejoined his mother and siblings thousands of kilometers away in Hamilton, Canada West. The conditions are most suitable To the passing of the sickness oh. All along the way they're dying And I 
after weeks upon an icy swell. I'm at Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada, but I'd like you to take yourself back 170 years to this very site when Irish migrants arrived to do work on the Welland Canal. In this pristine wilderness with this beautiful waterfall and where the only sound that was heard was not the traffic nor the voices of tourists or helicopters and airplanes flying in the air, but the thunder of the falls that dominated the soundscape of this area. It was in 1847 and 1848 that Irish famine migrants, after a horrendous voyage across the North Atlantic Ocean, quarantined at Grosil in Quebec. Again, fever sheds in places like Montreal, Kingston, and Toronto eventually made their way here. Why? Because there were other Irish settlers here before the famine. Why? Because there was work here on the Welland Canal that eventually would join Lake Erie and the Upper Great Lakes with Lake Ontario, the St. Lawrence and the Atlantic. This was one of the great projects of the 19th century, one of the great economic engines of this new country called Canada. And the Irish were here, particularly those who survived the Atlantic voyage, those who were the 1,490 migrants, uh, 274 families from Major Dennis Mann's estate at Strokestown in County Roscommon in Connacht province. In 1847, they made their way across the Atlantic in four ships, two of which could be aptly described as coffin ships. 25% of these people died. But those who did survive and who passed through the various quarantine stations made their way here and tried to recreate a part of their Irish world now in the Canadian wilderness here by the falls, here by the canal works. Two of those families were the O'Connor family and the Brennan family of Kilmackany townland on Dennis Mann's estate. The O'Connors and the Brennans knew each other in Strokestown. They traveled together en route to this part of North America. Thomas Brennan's family though was destroyed virtually. First his wife dying in Grosil and one of his children dying between Quebec and their arrival here. And so in late 1847, or perhaps even early 1848, Thomas Brennan and his daughter arrive here and reconnect with families like the O'Connors, like the Hopkins, like the Geary's, the Daltons, all from their estate. And in the process of doing that, tried to, in, in many ways, not to rekindle the old battles between families from the old world. Unfortunately, Bridget died at Grosseil, as did one of the children, and Thomas Brennan arrived here in late 1847, perhaps early 1848, to join others from his townland and from the Strokestown estate as they made their lives anew here in Niagara, digging on the Welland Canal. Now, it's unfortunate that Thomas Brennan's legacy is not quite so pleasant. Thomas Brennan was seen in the company of uh, Patrick and uh, Mary O'Connor, also from that estate, and then those two people disappeared. In the spring of 1848, their bodies were found at the bottom of this gorge, uh, Patrick having been bludgeoned to death by a hammer, and Mary having been stripped and strangled and left dead uh, in the Niagara Gorge. In fact, their son John had disappeared for a very short time. He had been tossed over the escarpment uh, and left for dead. Now the interesting thing about this story is, is that the number of people who engage in the trial of Thomas Brennan, who's eventually arrested in Toronto, trying to sell Mary's clothing, and in possession of a large sum of money that presumably he had taken from Patrick, uh, these Roscommon people are the ones who figure prominently in his trial. Daltons, Hopkins, O'Connors, Geary, which suggests to us that 
in some ways, these immigrants, despite the famine conditions that they left, really had tremendous agency in where they went, among other fellow Irishmen, pre-famine Irishmen, what they wanted to do to work, in this case the Welland Canal, and recreate as best they could their communities of Roscommon. So what we have here is a tragic event, a murder, which Thomas Brennan is eventually convicted of by the Assizes Court. He is hanged by the neck in the fall of 1848, and his body is buried not far from here uh, in the parish churchyard near St. Catharines. A tragic end to what was a horrendous journey and perhaps new hope that life could start anew here uh, in Canada uh, if you were Irish and you were from the Man Estate. The first stop they'll make is Liverpool In the cellars there below the street Down among the vermin and disease Some hide out until their ships can leave Lest they be deported back again This year America So they race for Canada before the ice closes the St. Lawrence. Now the crossing is so treacherous, with so many crammed into the hole. The conditions are most suitable To the passing of the sickness oh. All along the way they're dying After weeks upon an icy swell Those with strength to see the river still Are now witnessing the dead of night To a strange macabre spectacle Bloated bodies drifting out to sea And anchored up at Grosseal, Canada Forty vessels line the St. Lawrence At the station there for quarantine The sheer magnitude of suffering Is beyond the helpless volunteer Thousands they will perish there Despite all efforts to contain the spread Of the rampant typhus fever 
It's like wildfire up the river, all to run to win.